all nurses should have a bit more time. So if you think that a typical neurology appointment might be 10 minutes for a follow-up, maybe, maybe even a bit less, um, a nurse should really be having 20 minutes, half an hour for a follow-up, longer for, for, for a, a first review. Fellow Homo sapiens, now who knows about the value of an epilepsy specialist nurse? They often do a whole lot more than their title might imply. This week in part one of two, Phil Tittensall, a consultant nurse for the epilepsy, is a lecturer for the University of Wolverhampton and the chair of the Epilepsy Specialist Nurse Association in the UK, tells us about the variety of huge responsibilities of epilepsy specialist nurses, what services they offer and why we, we being patients, families and neurologists, we really need them. Also an announcement, we have some really cool gear slash merchandise like t-shirts, mugs, notepads, etc., which you've got to check out. Links are above or under the merch tab on epilepsysparks.com. And just an example, one of the t-shirts says, epilepsy does my head in. Hi Tori, thanks very much for the invitation. So I'm Phil Tittenser, I'm consultant nurse for epilepsies, uh, working up in Wolverhampton uh, with a Another hat on, I'm a, a, a lecturer for the University of Wolverhampton, and with a third hat on, which makes me feel a bit like Zaphod Beedlebrox, I'm also chair of the Epilepsy Nursery Association, I think we're going to talk a little bit about that. Tell us about the role of an epilepsy specialist nurse, or ESN, and what the person actually does. The role's really varied, so it, it, it's quite hard to say what every single ESM will do, but essentially they're there to support patients. That's the bottom line. Now they can do that in a number of different ways. The obvious one is face-to-face -face clinics, um, and since COVID, of course, um, a lot of that planned activity has gone remote, um, with some, uh, some clinics being offered over the phone, some video link clinics, uh, some are on Teams, there are various other uh, platforms out there uh, that, that, that are being utilised. Um, nurses will generally offer uh, some kind of an urgent advice service as well. Uh, some will do it by text and email as well as telephone. Uh, various different methods of doing it, but essentially it's to get advice to people fairly quickly in between appointments. So it, it's fa fairly pointless if you've sort of had a, had a great consultation, uh, maybe a new treatment suggested, um, and then three weeks later that treatment really doesn't suit you anymore and you think, oh, my next appointment's in six months' time, what do I do in the meantime? With the neurologist, you mean? Yeah. So lots of different levels of epilepsy nursing. This gets confusing for, for professionals and for patients because by and large they all have the same title. Some play on epilepsy specialist nurse. Um, but you have some nurses who are really extremely senior, they may be diagnosing the condition, though that's mainly the preserver of consultant nurses like myself. They may be independently managing the condition, so, so a neurologist has made the diagnosis, but then after that the nurse steps in with the, the treatment, changes treatment, suggests new treatment if the first drug isn't suiting for, not working for some reason, um, and, and all of the, the, the kind of the advice side, which can be everything from um, assessment of risk, uh, right through to, to driving or issues with employment, uh, problems with the, the, the medication itself, you, you name it really. Other nurses will be employed particularly to provide advice between appointments. So I can think of a couple of services where, where it is purely that and the, 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 the nurse is, is really providing generally telephone triage advice. You will have some nurses that are working really autonomously, so um, will refer, for example, to tertiary specialists if they think that there's surgical options um, because medication isn't working, VNS, that kind of thing. Um, and you will have other nurses that, that really support between consultant appointments. So the consultant may say, try drug X, um, maneuver between these dose ranges, try to find the, the, the optimal treatment, but then once it gets beyond that and, and you know they've reached the, maybe the top end of the dose range using that example, it would be back to the, uh, the, the consultant. So there's various different levels uh, and as I say, I, I think with my, my professional head on, 
do have a slight problem with title. Because with a, with a doctor, you kind of know, well, there may be a registrar, specialist registrar, senior clinical fellow, consultant. There's a hierarchy there. You can follow that through and you've got a fair idea of what, what level of practice each of those individuals will be working at. Very often with ESNs, the title is the same. So it doesn't really fairly indicate what their responsibilities are and what they actually do. Obviously the team, that local team, know exactly what that nurse can and can't do. But just simply looking at it as a, as a patient that says, ah, great, I've got an epilepsy specialist nurse. What that nurse can do varies from area to area. You've spoken about anti-seizure medications and seizures themselves and recommending for potentially surgeries like BNS. In my experience with epilepsy specialist nurses, um, there's the opportunity to talk more, I feel, um, have a little bit more time to talk about, for instance, psychiatric comorbidities or other comorbidities that often come along with the epilepsy because they often go hand in hand. Would you say that's a regular thing? Yes, I would say that's a core, um, a core role for the nurse. So al al although I've just said that various different levels of, of, of uh, expertise perhaps, all nurses should have a bit more time. So if you think that a typical neurology appointment might be 10 minutes for a follow-up, maybe, maybe even a bit less, um, a nurse should really be having 20 minutes, half an hour for a follow-up, longer for, for, for a, a first review. Um, so there is that time to go through things. Really interesting that you mentioned psychiatric comorbidity. Um, and I think that is an area that often gets neglected in, uh, in epilepsy. We all know that um, heightened emotions, if I can use it, put it in those terms, because it's not always the stress and anxiety that we think of. Um, excitement, for example, particularly with people with intellectual disability might, might trigger seizures. Actually, I've had that before, I have to say. Um, even though I don't officially have intellectual disability, when I was a kid, I remember getting so excited. There was this family event around Christmas and I was like, I'm so happy to see these people. And I had a seizure. Yeah, so, uh, so I've, I, I've picked an example there that, that is, uh, you know, an exception proving a rule. <laughs> but, but yeah, having the time to explore that, explore triggers for, for seizures, not, not just mood triggers. Um, we were talking just before we came on air, weren't we, about climate change and changes in temperature that can sometimes trigger seizures uh, for, for people with certain types of epilepsy. Um, how wide across the board is, is, is the subject of ongoing study. Um, looking at, at, at risk in, in other ways as well. Um, Tori, you and I have been involved in a, a little project on, on, on that. Um, and I think we don't always perhaps do it as well as we could but but actually having the time to say well what what do you think is a, a, a maybe a bad place to have a seizure where where if you had a seizure under these circumstances might there be more of a problem than if you had a seizure under different circumstances so you can start bringing in you know some of the um sort of uh, activities near water. Um, I suppose the one that always comes to my mind is, uh, is, is angling. Oh, really? I remember a chap many, many, many years ago, um, he had a, a, a focal seizure, focal awareness impaired seizure, um, and was fishing and woke up, up to his waist in the water. So things like that tend to stick in my, my mind. Um, so be able to explore that, like working at height, is there any machinery, what, what, what other things could be at risk, um, school teacher, uh, what, what, what's the risks around children, should we be going and talking to occupational health, does there need to be an assessment here, um, the prison officer I saw recently, another good case in point for both security and safety for, for, for him if he had a seizure on duty. So. Um, there's a wide variety of things that, that, that frankly, in, in the, the, the 10 minutes or so uh, in a, a medical consultation, you're not going to be able to address. Exactly. And often I find, well, I find this personally, in the, so many people that I talk to, um, especially because we often have difficulties with memory, but anxiety, you get to an appointment and you're like, I've forgotten what I wanted to ask. 
<laughs> ideally we do write it down but lots of us forget to write it down so it's like oh my goodness and so you like we we'll want to call you or call an epilepsy specialist nurse or perhaps someone by another title that they deserve to get advice on this thing you know on, on our point of um, concern that's the key thing that's what i was um, talking about a few minutes ago uh, it's that advice in between times and it may be the thing and, and you know I get this I'm sure most other nurses who might be looking at this uh, would think the same that, that you, you, you suddenly get a message could you phone this person you thought I've only just seen them in clinic um, uh, and actually it's a I intended to ask you this and, and, and it just slipped my mind um, and, and I think sometimes if you can head off that worry um, that, that's a really big thing. Yeah. Um, I suppose as well as epilepsy, I mean, we, we, we deal with um, non-epileptic attack disorder. Um, and, and a lot of epilepsy nurses do, not all, but, but a lot do. And I think sometimes with that condition as well, if you are really worried about something, uh, or you've gone away perhaps with a muddled impression, actually being able to quickly put you right on that can, can save an awful lot of, 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 of angst um, so, so I think it's really important. As a sort of overall statement if there is possibility of having uh, or creating one what do you think is the positive difference that epilepsy specialist nurses and colleagues um, with slightly different titles um, make to the lives of patients and their families? I would like to think that um, the patients find nurses accessible, supportive, knowledgeable. Um, there's no point in being able to get hold of somebody fairly easily if they are um, only able to say, okay, I'll relay your concerns to another person and get back to you. Mm. So, so there's got to be that, that level of expertise as well. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it, it's sort of trying to provide that timely advice I think very few services will have emergency advice, as in, um, you know, my, my husband's having a, a seizure right now, what do I do? I, don't, I can't think of any service in the country that, that can do that. That's the proviso of the emergency services, 999 and 111. Um, but uh, in terms of being able to get rapid advice, you know, my, my husband had a seizure, paramedics had to, to come out yesterday, um, what shall we do? That's vitally important and, and as you know very very well, Tori, because you're extremely well versed in, in epilepsy, um, sadly when things are going badly wrong um, and maybe risks are increasing and thinking about sudden unexpected death for example, Sadly, we often see that seizure control has deteriorated in the, the, the weeks and months um, before the person has, has passed away. So actually being, having somebody available who's an expert in the condition at that time so you can ring up and say things are not going so well and maybe you know maybe you've got an increased score on your, your Epsmon app or, 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 or something like that. Um, actually being able to say yeah okay we have a reason for that and, it, and it's this and some reassurance or heck we don't have a reason for that and we need to do something about it now that's really important vitally important so to me as a summary epilepsy nurses specialist nurses can not solely improve the lives of people affected but also literally save the lives sometimes not directly but almost directly Yes, because it, it's that timely intervention. If your seizures are um, worsening, mm. there is no point at all in you having an appointment uh, in five months' time. You need some advice, maybe not that day, but that week. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Phil. Thanks very much, Tori. Pleasure. Thanks so much to Phil for his insight in part one about epilepsy specialist nurses. And do make sure that you tune in next week for part two, where we will be speaking about being an epilepsy consultant nurse and being involved in epilepsy research. To learn more about Phil, make sure that you check him out at toryrobinson.com slash epilepsy hyphen sparks hyphen insights, where you can find out more about him and links to his work. 
Also, check out our cool gear slash merchandise, t-shirts, mugs, notepads and stuff, which you can check out using the link below or find under the merch tab at epilepsysparks.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please do share it with your friends, family and colleagues because it really helps us to get the messages about the epilepsies out to the masses. Music